Welcome back to another example from chapter 11. In this example, we have a person standing on a block of ice, and what we want to figure out is how much ice, what mass of this iceberg do we need in order to keep that person's feet dry. So that will hold the person out of the water, but the block is going to be just underneath the surface to balance. So what we're looking at are the forces. Yet again, we're going to draw a free body diagram. And we're looking at the free body diagram of the ice block specifically. So we're going to be thinking about what forces are acting on that ice block. So we have the weight of the ice. So F G of the ice, which is going to be equal to the mass of the ice. That's our unknown times G. We also have the weight of the person because they are standing on the block of ice, pushing down on that block of ice. And so when we think about how that force would look on the ice block, it is simply a force downward that we can call a force of gravity because it's coming from the fact that this person has weight. So this is the gravity of the person. So this is the mass of the person which we do have, so we'll put it in just a second, times g. So we have 70 times 9.8, or 686 newtons. All right, now there are no surfaces that the ice block is sitting on. Certainly, if we were to draw the forces acting on the person, they would have their own gravity down, and the normal force from the block up. And we will talk in the lecture slide videos and upcoming examples that for solid objects like this person in air, we do not have to worry about a buoyant force, but that would otherwise be a force up as well. But in this case, we don't have that. And that's why um, we don't need to worry about any normal forces on the ice block because itself is not sitting on a surface. We don't have friction. We don't have tension. The only other force that we have, the thing that is causing the ice not to fall, is the fact that it is floating in water. And that idea of floating comes from the buoyant force. So the buoyant force is the density of the fluid. So that's the surrounding water times the volume of the displaced fluid, so that's the volume of the ice in this example, times the acceleration of gravity g. All right, so really key here, just like before, we are looking at the net forces and the fact that they're going to add up to zero. We're in this kind of stable situation where the buoyant force up minus the force of gravity on the ice minus the force of gravity from the person, all adds up to zero. In the previous example, we had two up arrows and one down arrow. In this example, we have one up arrow and two down arrows. And hopefully we recognize from all of our work in chapter four that the point is not to guess at the plus and minus signs. The point is to look at our free body diagram, the map that we drew, to recognize why we're adding versus subtracting because of the direction of the arrows. All right, so let's plug in what we have. For the buoyant force, the fluid is the water, 1,000. The volume of the ice, we don't know at the moment. G is 9.8. So we have that first term. The force of gravity on the ice is the mass of the ice times 9.8. And the force of gravity on the person we have is 686. All right. It looks like we have two unknowns. However, those two unknowns are related to each other through the fact that they are both relative to the ice block. And the density of ice is a known quantity. So we can write this down. And I'm going to multiply both sides by the unknown volume. The ice density is 917, so 917 times that unknown volume of the ice is equal to the mass of the ice. 
So I'm actually going to plug that in right here. So we have 9,800 times the volume of the ice minus, in this case, we have the 917 times that volume of ice times 9.8. And I'm going to add 686 to both sides just to get it on the other side. All right, here we are. So I can multiply 9.8 and 917 together in my calculator, and then I'll have this many V ice minus that many V ice. So we have 9,800, and then 9.8 times 917 is 8987, and both of those were attached to V ice, so I've just kind of factored that out, equals 686. And so this 9,800 9, minus 8987, that's 813. So we're going to divide both sides by that 813. And down near the bottom, we have that the ice block volume is kind of small looking. 0.843 cubic meters. So that isn't the final answer here. But remember, we went through and we recognized that the mass of ice and the volume of ice are related to each other. So we can plug it bit back in to what we had over there. So 917 times that volume we've just gotten, 0.843, that's going to be equal to the mass that we're looking for. And that will be the end of our problem. So when we do that, what we get is a number that now looks quite reasonable to us in terms of being a big or a small number. It will take 770 rounded kilograms worth of ice just to keep this person afloat above the water. So when we have our result in terms of volume, it doesn't feel very big to us because we are not used to thinking about volumes very much. We don't have any kind of intuition for what a cubic meter actually looks like because it is actually a very large volume. And 0.843 cubic meters is still quite a large volume of ice. If that ice were in front of you, you wouldn't think that that number is small. But with kilograms, we have a better intuition for what that looks like because we can compare the fact that the ice, we're going to have to have 11 times the mass of ice just to hold up this 70 kilogram person. So I want, to, want us to recognize a couple of key things. So first of all, if we solve for the volume and we think that it's a little bit too small, don't give up on your result. Keep going because we don't have good intuition for what volumes should look like. The other thing, and I starred it and circled it in red in the previous example, just like before, with each of our objects in the problem, we really do tend to need this understanding of density as a definition of mass over volume, so that if it looks like we have too many unknowns, we don't actually have too many unknowns. This is still going to come up and it's going to be used constantly in these buoyant force problems. So for this example, we have kind of commentary back in the lecture slides about how much volume, for example, a human being takes up because we tend to overestimate our personal space. Um, but otherwise, this example is complete. We have two more fully worked examples of buoyant force problems. And so I will see you in those next videos.